Around the country, efforts to ban specific books or even whole categories of books are on the rise. 1,500 book bans in schools across the U.S. I'm working on helping the school district uh, remove vulgar books from our school libraries. Censorship is not the legacy to create. That's more bans than in 2018, 2019, and 2020 combined. We organize a nationwide book burning. Simply a fundamental repression of ideas. Books are powerful things. They can help you to escape to another universe or learn more about your own. And the profound importance of books and fiction is something I really try to champion on this channel. However, this week, I'm actually going to be doing something that I've never done before, and that is reading banned books. Right here, I have four books that have been banned very recently for various reasons. But across the world, and over time, many books have actually been banned, and some may surprise you. In the USA, Chaucer's Canterbury Tales were once banned, as was Howl by Allen Ginsberg and Moth Flanders by Daniel Defoe, not gonna lie. Wouldn't have minded if that last one had stayed banned because <laughs> it was the bane of my English degree, seriously. Here in France, where I am right now, both Madame Bovary and Lolita have been banned at some point. And in the UK, so have Ulysses and Lady Chatterley's Lovers. Now, a lot of these books are books that we now celebrate and study, but a lot of those books I just mentioned have been banned over time for obscenity and sexually explicit language. And of course, over time, fiction has also been highly political. In the Soviet Union, there was an author called Boris Pasternak, and they banned his novel Dr. Zivago from publication. It had to be published in Italy instead. Now, he would eventually go on to win the Nobel Prize for Literature, but his country forced him to turn it down. His family did eventually accept it on his behalf, though, after his death. Also, in Nazi Germany, books were burned. Books seen as harmful or dangerous were literally purged, and that included authors like Fitzgerald, Hemingway, Victor Hugo, Tolstoy, and Conrad. And so it's easy to think of book burnings as something relegated to history. But books are still banned today, and that's what I wanted to talk about in this video. Many books find themselves banned, especially in libraries and schools. And so I did some research. I looked up a list of the 10 most frequently banned books in the last decade. I then chose these four from the list, which have all been banned for different reasons. And so here they are. We have The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison, Me, Earl and the Dying Girl by Jesse Andrews, George M. Johnson's All Boys Aren't Blue, and finally Mao by Art Spiegelman. In this video, I'm going to read each of these books and give you a little review, but also tell you why they were banned in the first place. And I'm excited, you know, to do something a little bit different. Normally we're reading books recommended by celebrities or TikTok or TV shows. Not today, these <laughs> have been banned. But before we dive into those, I'm very excited to let you know that today's video is brought to you by Book of the Month. Book of the Month is a brilliant online book subscription service. They can help you find your next favorite read by vetting literally hundreds of books and then picking their favorites. You can then select a book to read from this expertly curated list so you can spend less time researching and more time actually reading. As you know, I'm a big fan of finding new and emerging authors and this has been the perfect way to do that and read books that maybe I wouldn't have encountered otherwise. My selection for this month is currently in the post on its way to me and I can't freaking wait. I chose Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow by Gabrielle Zavin, which I cannot wait to read. But in the meantime, Book of the Month have also launched as a podcast where the team chats with Book of the Month author and this month is the author whose book I chose. So I cannot wait to listen to that and get more of an insight into the novel. Now what's very cool about Book of the Month is that if none of the selection take your fancy in a given month, you can just skip that month completely for free. And Book of the Month gets you a real bargain on new hardback fiction. Plus, using the code JACK, you can actually get your first book for just $9.99. Book of the month, deal of the century. Link is in the bio down below. You are welcome. So let's get going with these books and hopefully I don't end up wanting to chuck any of these on a fire. I'm kidding. We both know I could never bring myself to do that. However, I'm not afraid to roast them. So <laughs> let's go. Okay, we are starting off very strong because The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison is genuinely I think one of the best books I've ever read. It is outrageous and audacious that this is a debut novel. What? It's compelling, it's stunning, it is shocking. I will say from the outset, however, that if I stood here and gave you a list of every trigger warning in this book, that would be the rest of the video. So I would advise looking those up. But in general, there are themes of racism, of sexual assault, of child abuse, of incest, which are obviously incredibly, incredibly uncomfortable to read. But Toni Morrison's point is that just because these things are uncomfortable to read, it doesn't mean we 
shouldn't read about them. When she won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1993, she spoke about the importance of not blinking or turning away from the things that plague society or the evils of humanity. And those are depicted in here. And I think drawing attention to those wrongdoings and injustices and putting them at the center of our attention is a real common thread throughout Toni Morrison's literary oeuvre. But not everyone has understood it that way. The book has been challenged and banned over the years, mostly on account of its sexually explicit material and its graphic descriptions and disturbing language. At one point, it was also said to have an underlying communist agenda, mostly just because it holds up a mirror to America and says, look, this is what we are. This depicts a real experience of that society. And yes, the style of storytelling is savage and relentless and unsparing and angry and difficult. There is rage behind these words. It doesn't sugarcoat any of the details, nor does it shy away from them. And so I think that Toni Morrison's point was so long as these things continue to occur to real people, we should write about them. And so she did. So in The Bluest Eye, we basically follow a poor black family who are just battered by tragedy. It's set in the 1940s in Ohio, and they're facing severe financial hardship in the wake of the depression. Now the book gets its title because the youngest daughter in this family, whose name is Pecola, basically prays every single night to have blue eyes like those of her rich, privileged white classmates. That desire for blue eyes becomes one big metaphor for her own inferiority complex. She describes her ugliness as shrouding her like a cloak or a mantle. She has been conditioned to feel so ashamed about the way that she looks, that she develops this completely impossible desire for her eye colour to change. To her, that symbolises the only possibility of moving out of her current socio-economic position. The desire for blue eyes is a desire to escape oppression. And of course, as the reader, the harsh reality that we acknowledge is that that isn't going to be possible for her. And so what Toni Morrison has essentially created here is an elegy an elegy for the suffering of black people post-slavery because of the attitudes and prejudices that still perforated society, every aspect of it, every single day, on every single occasion, at any given opportunity. So it's a tough read, but the writing in here is just exquisite. It's like poetry. It's also very, very experimental. It explores the concept of shame as well as internalized racism as a result of external racism. Should this book be banned outright, as some people want it to be. Of course not. That kind of goes against everything Toni Morrison wanted and set out to do by writing this thing. She wanted to avoid shying away from or ignoring these difficult themes. And so banning the book is essentially doing exactly that. However, having said that, I definitely do think that reading this book requires some prior knowledge of the themes. Like, I wouldn't feel comfortable recommending this to my friends, my family, to you guys, without making sure that the person I'm recommending to has read the trigger warnings and knows what they're in for, just in case this is not something that would be healthy or conducive for that person to consume, you know, if that is due to personal trauma. So I will leave links down below to some good sources for finding trigger warnings if you need them. But having said all of that, I personally rate this book very, very highly, which feels like an odd thing to say, you know, about something that is so raw and laced with pain. But I think Toni Morrison is a genius. I hated reading about these things, but that's the point. I think that's a very important distinction to make, and I think that's exactly what she was trying to do. So, Justice for the Bluest Eye, I thought this was spectacular, and now, on to the next book. Now, in stark contrast to the previous book, because it's all about range, I hated this. Never in my life have I despised a narrator as much as I did with this book, with Me Earl and the Dying Girl. I think that he is meant to be obnoxious, like it is intentional. And don't get me wrong, I'm all here for a flawed or evil main character. I live for that. Usually I enjoy those kinds of books, not this one. <laughs> I hated this. I felt like my legs had been chopped off because I couldn't stand the character. Honestly, I just found this one <laughs> completely intolerable. And the best part about this book for me was when it ended. When I turned that final page and realized I never had to read it again. Me, Earl, and the Dying Girl, more like me, Earl, and the Dying Attention Span of the reader. I think the main issue here is that there is nothing worse than trying to consume a piece of media that is trying to be funny, 
and doesn't land with you. Maybe my sense of humour was just not compatible with the sense of humour of this book, but the protagonist, for me, the antagonist, is a guy called Greg. He is the, the me, out of the me, Earl and the dying girl. And he's basically always tried to stay out of trouble. He's always tried to sort of blend into the background and just get through school, just survive. He's essentially consigned himself to a life of mediocrity at school and he's fine with that. He's going under the radar. Instead, he pretty much just has one friend called Earl. And Greg and Earl make amateur films together. They also narrate amateur books. No, I can't say that. And then one day, his mom forces him to become friends with a girl who has cancer. It's almost like the anti The Fault in Our Stars, because it does not try to romanticize this situation, to make it deep and meaningful. It just exists. There's no tragic love story. It's a very normal situation. And I actually was looking forward to reading that. However, I felt like this just was trying so hard to be gritty and raw and brutal, and I just found it annoying. <laughs> I'm sorry. I definitely think that being crass can be funny, but there's such a fine line where it becomes cheap humor. And this book didn't just cross it, it pole vaulted over that line. And aside from the tone of the book just not really being enjoyable to me personally, I also found the depiction of Earl's family incredibly strange to read. It is riddled with unnecessary and rude stereotypes about black families, especially in contrast to Greg's white family. I found it really odd. Now, even though I think this book is genuinely terrible, that isn't why it's been banned. In fact, it's actually been made into a quite successful movie adaptation, which perhaps is better than the book, because I know that a lot of people really do like that film. But this book was one of the most challenged books of 2021. And the reason for that is that it is considered degrading to women, which I definitely agree with. And it's also been criticized for being sexually explicit. Now, there is a lot of crude language and swear words within the pages of this book. And I think what the author, Jesse, Andrews was trying to show is that this is often how young teenage brains perceive the world and that is how they think. But I don't think that it was delivered in an interesting way, nor was it tastefully done. And so Me, Earl and the Dying Girl was actually removed alongside six other books last year from a lot of schools for containing vulgar language. Quite a few parenting committees across the USA basically protested against this book, saying that there is no way that this should be in the hands of children. Now, I would love to hear what you guys think about this argument because I genuinely don't know how I feel about that. Like, should we prevent kids from being exposed to real language that is really used? Or is this part of the learning experience? Should we give kids more credit? I do think that it's wrong to suggest that just because someone is young, they can't identify harmful behavior, and also to know when something should not be replicated. I, I don't know. I personally would not recommend this book, but I don't know if it should be banned outright. What I do know, regardless of that, is that I hated this book on a deeply personal level. It genuinely filled me with rage and not, not in a fun way. More like, is it possible to get a refund on a book that you've already read in its entirety. I think I've rounded it up to two stars on Goodreads, which still feels generous. It's hard to defend you, me, Earl and the Dying Girl. I'd be really interested to know what people enjoyed about this book, because I, I really can't see it. But anyway, let's hope that the next book is a bit more successful for me. So far in this video, I've managed to read a book I absolutely loved, a book that I really didn't, and now one that falls kind of in between. This is All Boys Aren't Blue. By the way, chef's kiss for that title. And this is by George M. Johnson. This is described on the back as bold and brave and queer, and it covers so many hugely important themes. It's a memoir about the intersection of growing up both black and queer in America, and it covers gender identity, notions of masculinity, spoiler alert, mostly toxic, because masculinity gives that Britney Spears song a run for its money, but it also covers things like consent and black joy and family relationships. And obviously it goes without saying that you do not need to identify with being black or queer or American to take something away from this book. It's definitely worth the read. It's raw, it's tender, and it's heartfelt. And a reflection on an interesting early life. It covers first sexual experiences and trauma and tragedy, things like bullying, but mostly I think that this book is all about the importance of cultivating an environment which is supportive and affirming so that the people around you can be their truest selves when they are in your presence. And it's about what we can all do to achieve that. And that is something that I think we're all hopefully striving for. So thematically, I am so glad this book exists. What I will say, because I am always honest with you, is that I didn't 
fall in love with the writing style. I felt that it was a little bit dry at times and sometimes oversimplified. It wasn't necessarily captivating or compelling. Like I didn't find myself wanting to pick this up and read more because the writing style just didn't draw me in. And I think that that response comes from the fact that the cover refers to this as a memoir manifesto. And I think it's definitely more memoir than manifesto. I think manifesto is way too strong a word for this. There are anecdotes which lead to wider lessons. Sometimes I think it's a little bit didactic even and over explains the symbolism of a certain moment. I don't know, an interesting discovery that I made after finishing reading this, I immediately Googled to find out if there is such thing as the genre YA memoir. And it turns out there is, and that is what this falls under. So I, I do think that kind of makes sense perhaps because if you've done any reading into the themes that are um, depicted in this book, I will say that you've probably already encountered most of what this book talks about just in an academic setting where it is better articulated. While it is groundbreaking and incredibly exciting to see authors like this being published, I don't think this is like the defining manifesto that it's marketed as. Occasionally there are some kind of facts and figures, but I felt that they were a bit clumsy in their placement. Like I just don't know if it flowed as well as it could. And that I think is where it's so important to draw the distinction when when you're reviewing books of like, objectively, I'm thrilled that this exists, this is so important. And subjectively, I didn't love the execution of it. Do you know what I mean? I cannot overstate the importance of books like these taking up space on a bookshelf and being published and in bookstores and in circulation. But as a book that I am reviewing, it was like a three star for me. I hope that that makes sense. And now onto why this book has been banned. Now this has regularly been censored or removed or banned from school libraries. And actually <laughs> at one point, this is the most ridiculous story you're gonna hear today, by the way, this retired teacher filed a criminal complaint against the superintendent because he was carrying this book. She was mad that this book references self pleasure and oral sex. Like what? That's the kind of person who will call you a snowflake for having even slightly liberal views whilst they're a whole snowstorm. That's a whole blizzard in a woman. Cause she's gonna be frosty. She's gonna have a cold, bitter heart. I mean, it was a grown adult reading this book. Like what is the point in that? Obviously, suffice to say the charges were dropped. Across America, there have also been protests around the banning of this book, which has actually been banned in some areas as recently as late last year. So this continues to be very divisive and polarizing for some reason. But in my opinion, and I'm sure yours too, this is a very necessary book, which I don't think should be banned at all. I think young people will find a lot of value in this, especially because it is mostly written about growing up and that process. Not a perfect book, but a good one. This is All Boys on Blue. And now onto the final book. Hello everyone. So I've been editing this video and I wanted to add in this clip because I've been thinking, which is usually dangerous, but obviously in the process of editing this video together, I've been really contemplating these book bans. And one thing I wanted to point out, which you may have noticed as a common thread, is that often the reasons for people trying to ban these books are not really the real reason that they mean. Often when people have attempted to ban these books, they've highlighted things like a sexually explicit language, or as we just saw, themes of self-pleasure and oral sex, when really, I think they have other reasons for wanting to ban these books. Instead of outright saying, we don't want these books about gender identity and racism to appear in schools, they find excuses to kind of mask their prejudices and what they don't want to appear in schools. When really, I think about most classic novels or books that I studied during my time at school, and almost all of them have sexual language or even racist language. And yet none of the books that I've looked at are white authors who use like the N-word and parents being like, we don't want our kids to be exposed to racism. Instead, they don't want their kids to be exposed to racial theory. And I think that's an important distinction. It really shows the intention of the people who are trying to get these books banned and stifled and suppressed. So that's one thing I've been thinking about. The second thing that I wanted to say is that the next book I'm gonna speak about is Mouse. Now, when I was talking about it, I referred to it as a graphic novel because I thought that was how it was supposed to be referred to. However, I did a bit more research and I realized that Art Spiegelman who wrote it actually prefers that it's not called a graphic novel, but instead a graphic historical book or a graphic historical memoir because what he depicts did really happen. It's not fiction, it's fact. And so I just wanted to add that context because in the next clips you'll see, I do refer to it as a graphic novel, but it is not fiction. These are real accounts of the Holocaust that actually did happen. So I just wanted to add this clip in just to clarify that. Um, and yeah, this is the final book. <sighs> I have finished this book. Actually, it might have finished me. This is Mouse by Art Spiegelman, and I genuinely think it should be essential reading. It's a graphic novel and just one of the most moving and captivating and brutal things 
I've ever encountered. It tells the story of Art Spiegelman's parents during the Holocaust, recounted through a series of conversations with his late father. Firstly, as you can see, the artwork is absolutely stunning. It's breathtaking, sometimes devastatingly so. The depictions of pain and suffering provoke this really visceral response in these tiny little pictures. It really, really affected me. It's the kind of thing you need to take breaks from just to take it all in. It is absolutely an artistic and literary triumph. Now, one of the artistic choices within this book is to depict Jewish people as mice. Nazis are portrayed by cats, pigs are substitutes for non-Jewish Polish people, and dogs take the place of Americans. I didn't know how well that would work, but weirdly, the dehumanization of these characters actually only serves as a constant reminder that these are substitutes for real people. And the author, Art Spiegelman, is a character within the book. And I think that the fact that he is always present, even in his mouse form, is just this permanent reminder of the humanity of each of these characters. And as I kind of just alluded to, there's also moments where he breaks the fourth wall and it's mind blowing and magnificent. Suddenly we zoom out and his character speaks directly to the reader. You know, because he is negotiating this navigation of the story as well. He's working out the best way to try to do justice to this story. We see him in therapy. There's also these brilliant moments where he's almost addressing the inevitable audience response that this will get, and such clever moments where we start to see the divide where the human becomes the mask of the mouse, and we see that facade starting to kind of crack. He discusses the kind of pressure of there having to be some grand message here or some sort of moral, when really the point of mouse is to expose the truth and to educate people on this account that is true of what really happened to his parents. And you know, even the heroes of this book are not completely unflawed. His dad exhibits some really racist behavior in later life. And so I guess my point here is that although the cartoons dehumanize them, we are constantly reminded of their humanity, of the fact that these are real people. These are also really accounts of the last conversations that Art Spiegelman had with his father. And I think that really draws attention to the fact that not that many Holocaust survivors are still around to be able to tell these stories, and so it's so important to listen to them while we can and write them down and make sure that these things are passed on to the next generation, and this is like a tangible way of doing that. And his father did unfortunately die before the publication of part two of this book, so there is this harsh reminder of mortality too. He also highlights that being a survivor of the Holocaust was not always a result of being super tactful or resourceful, these killings in concentration camps were often random and spontaneous acts of violence. So it's not like a guide of how one man survived the Holocaust, it's kind of an elegy for everyone who didn't. And it's actually split into two books. I have The Complete Mouse, so this is both of the books combined into one edition. Part one was really, really, really good, but part two is a masterpiece, and the combined effect of both is like nothing else I've ever read. It is spellbinding, I think that everyone should read this. Which brings us on to the topic of banning this book. This is actually what kind of inspired the video because there was a huge controversy last year when this book was banned. Now the reason behind the ban in various schools and areas in the United States is, well, it was a weird one because people kind of shrouded and masked their complaints by talking about the nudity in the book. Which can I just say is the tiniest little section. Firstly, it's a cartoon. Secondly, the pictures are small. And thirdly, and most importantly of all, it is not sexualized at all. The people in that particular image that they're talking about are being humiliated and tortured. I just, I lose faith in humankind when things like this happen, you know? It's like, how could you read this book and think of it as anything other than essential? And much like The Bluest Eye and All Boys Aren't Blue, it's the very lack of information about the themes of this book that make it crucial. Yes, often they're shocking, but that's what makes them necessary. I mean, all of the books that I've spoken about in this video, aside from Miel and the Dying Girl, like, we don't talk about that. This is not about you, Miel and the Dying Girl, okay? You sit this one out. All the other books are educational in their own ways and vitally important. It is mindlessly stupid to try to ban something like this when it becomes increasingly crucial to educate the next generations of people about these tragedies that took place and these horrible, horrific events. 
that human beings did, human beings are capable of. Also, shall we even begin to talk about how kids are going to experience way worse the second they log onto the internet for the first time? Like, what are you even sheltering them from? Now, ironically, the ban of this book actually led to what's called the Streisand effect. This is a phenomenon that occurs when something is attempted to be censored or removed or hidden, and as a result of that, the reverse effect actually happens. And an unintended consequence of attempts to ban and stifle this book is that it actually sold out pretty much everywhere. This was really hard to get a hold of. So the Streisand effect, if you haven't heard of it before, is basically a story about when a photographer who was documenting coastal erosion <laughs> took all these pictures across a certain coast and one of those pictures happened to be quite a clear view of Barbara Streisand's house. Because it was like on the beachfront at the top of a cliff, right? Anyways, she basically thought this was a massive invasion of privacy and launched a huge lawsuit against the photographer who had uploaded these pictures. And in the process of doing that, actually drew way more attention to the photo. So to put this into numbers, beforehand, prior to the lawsuit, only six people had downloaded the picture and two of them were Barbara Streisand's attorneys. Following the lawsuit becoming public, 420,000 people downloaded the picture in a single month. And that, my friends, is the Streisand effect, which completely happened to this book last year. So somehow, inadvertently, and very ironically, the attempts to ban this book actually boosted its sales, and it kind of brought it back into conversation and discourse, which probably is actually a good thing. I'd highly recommend this book. I have not stopped thinking about it since I finished it. Yeah, I can't do it justice, it's just phenomenal. So, there you go. This has been really interesting and enlightening. I've read some great books. I also read Me, Earl and the Dying Girl, <laughs> but that's beside the point. To my core, I am a hater and I'm sorry about it. I, I just, that book was not good. This has been my experience of reading four of the most banned books of the last decade. I hope that maybe there's some kind of Streisand effect here too and this could encourage you to go and read one of these magnificent books. Okay, my camera decided to run out of battery at the final hurdle but all that was left to say is if you liked this video please do give it a thumbs up and you can subscribe for more from me. I actually might do a part two to this video because obviously here I mostly focused on books that have been banned in schools and libraries but I could do a part two on books that have been banned in prisons and maybe that could be quite interesting. So let me know if that's something you'd be interested in in the comment section down below. Until next time thank you so so much for watching this video. A massive shout out to Book of the Month for sponsoring it. The link is down below. Until next time all the best. Stay in touch. Have a wonderful day and I'll catch you very soon. Bye-bye!